Vision Corporation is a leading automotive electronic supplier and technology company that's leading the way to a connected digital and electric future. And talking to me about this transition and the company's plans is Sachin Lawande, who is the president and CEO of Vision Corporation. Sachin, thanks for talking to us. Uh, Thank and you. Uh, welcome to India, firstly. Uh, you are from uh, India, Goa, so I'm sure you're happy to be back. And, you know, just wanted to start off with uh, the Indian market and how you've seen it evolve and really your plans for it. Terrific. First of all, I'm glad to be back after two and a half years. And thank you for inviting me to have a conversation with you. Um, we are big fans of you and, and your publication and look forward to uh, having a good conversation today about uh, many topics um, that, that are of interest to both of us. But um, talking about the Indian market, uh, after coming back to India um, after two and a half years, I'm actually very optimistic with what I've seen and the meetings that I've had with um, the car manufacturers. I would say the Indian market is in a period of transition. I'm seeing that the um, automakers as well as the consumers are pushing for more technology in the vehicles. There's a realization that the cars are more and more a mobile device on wheels. And customers are willing to pay for it. Isn't and it? customers are willing to pay for it. I was really encouraged to listen to some consumers, in fact. My family members, first time car buyers, very young, in their early 20s, willing to pay 10 lakh, 10 lakh of rupees for their first car, which is something that would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. I think a good thing, and that's pushing the car manufacturers themselves to up their game. The technologies in the cars that used to be in the past very basic, now we are seeing a really nice uplift in the capability. So very excited about Just that. talking about screens and yes. what I say, the, the screenification of cars for a better word. Screen are, screens are getting bigger. Uh, I don't know how big is too big. Right. Uh, so I want you to talk to me on that, you know, what's the maximum size we'll see or will it just go end to end like in a Mercedes from uh, the, the whole dashboard? Uh, also, you know, they're fundamentally rectangular in shape. Are we going to see more organic shapes? Are we going to see more curved screens? Is that the future trend? Yeah. Uh, so just wanted to get your sense on where is the, where is, uh, you know, the, the screens are really now, now the kind of what I would say the must have feature. But, Correct. you know, I think it's going beyond that. So I think it's really important to understand that there are some intrinsic drivers that is driving this trend of larger screens in automotive. And the trends mainly are the success of ADAS and the fact that there is a expectation on part of OEMs driven by their experiences with smartphones and tablets that they need to see the same kind of capabilities and, and user experience and quality inside the car. So these two drivers are causing screens to be bigger even in what would be considered a value uh, vehicle. So the third driver is the popularity of CarPlay and Android Auto. Right? These are technologies that allow you to project from your phone into the dash of the screen. And CarPlay and Android Auto have been pushing the boundaries and have been mandating a certain size and resolution of the screens that is forcing the car OEMs to increase the display sizes. So the cluster, is that because of a multiple display? Uh, they, uh, even before that, right? So even before, even if you don't have multiple displays, to, in order for you to say that your vehicle supports CarPlay, it has to be a minimum of 8 inches display and a certain resolution. And as they go forward, they are mandating that the size gets bigger because they can take more, can show more uh, information. They can do it in a way that is not as distractive to the um, consumer, to the driver, right? D reduce the disruption, reduce the risk. And to your point, they are now launching a multi-screen capability with CarPlay. So the same with Android Auto. Basically, CarPlay and Android Auto will allow the phone to project information on up to three screens, your center stack, on the cluster, as well as on the passenger side. Wow. And that's going to be accessible to all vehicles. Now, it's a very competitive market. As soon as one OEM decides to introduce vehicles with larger displays, it immediately makes the product from other OEMs look like they are outdated. And you have seen some examples of that in the Indian market already. 
So what's happening is in the value side, we're seeing the displays get bigger and bigger. So 10 inch display is going to be the standard going forward. Today in the marketplace, most of them are seven or eight inches. So that's going to get bigger. Now, what that does is that puts pressure on the luxury OEMs. Now speaking a little bit for OEMs outside of India, Mercedes, BMW, Audi, because they set the trends and ultimately all of that comes into the mass market over time, as you know. So what we are seeing is the desire to differentiate themselves from maybe the mass market producers, largely through the screens. So we are working on 48 inch wide displays, pretty much pillar to pillar. Okay, so now there are new terms that we have to now start to use. Okay, a driver information display or a DID, a center information display or a CID, and a passenger information display or a PID. How do we see that filtering down uh, into more mass cars and coming again Correct. to India? Do you think it's only a matter of time before it will be democratized to a larger extent and this will be the order of the day even in India? Because, you know, as things do get more affordable and cheaper once uh, they're made in large volumes. Right. So what will likely be the case in India? And I think the example that we have in front of us is the W601 or the XUV700 from Mahindra. Right, you see a very large display. In that particular case, it was two 10 inch displays behind this nice cover lens. What we see is that those 10 inch displays are gonna get larger. Imagine two or even three 12 inch displays, nicely done under one cover lens, gives the appearance of a single large display. Right. That's gonna be one of the first things that happen in the Indian context. Now, in order to improve the perception of the display, we are bringing new technologies such as optical bonding, loca bonding, right. okay, which is new for the market. Prior to this, they were all air bonded, meaning yes. there used to be an air gap, and okay. and you felt the and that quality the compromise was, the resolution. Cor correct, the resolution wasn't good. The reflectivity was too high. Brightness was a problem, and that crisp iPhone-like display was not a pos possibility. Right. That is being taken care of once you move to the optical bonding. And the way we believe we can democratize it is by investing in that capability in India. So we will actually manufacture so you displays. Will you, uh, op, you will have optically, optically bonded, bonded screens in India. In, manufactured in India. Right. The first plant is going online very soon, later this year, and we'll have the capacity to build just over 1 million displays. Will you export from there or, or not? I believe that we will consume all of that capacity in India itself, wow. right? A million displays in automotive, and we are thinking already of a second plant and the location yet to be determined because we believe displays are going to be like at least in 50% of the vehicles sold in the market will carry these larger displays. Right. And we hope to be the first to introduce this capability, capture the share of the market. And I believe very quickly, once we get to that 12 inches, you can only make a display flat and rectangular up to about 12, in, 12 inches. The moment you go beyond that, it has to be curved and right. it has to have a different form factor. Right. Now for that, the technology is fundamentally different. Now you are into the uh, different kind of OLED technology. So we are very excited. We're working with the leading OLED suppliers to build OLED on glass. So OLED on glass fundamentally lowers the cost, allows us to have different shaped glass. We know how to make glass sh have different shapes and curvature. There are different ways to do that, either hot formed or cold formed, but there are ways to do it. And then you build OLED on top of it. So imagine you'll have this curved glass display that fits the form factor and design of your instrument panel, right. but it's a display. And yeah. when it is turned off, it's pitch black. Right. But uh so, do you think, you know, obviously this is at the higher end and you were talking about, you know, manufacturing uh, over here to make it more accessible Correct. in terms of cost. Do you foresee a time where all cars, even base cars, will no longer be have any analog display and they will all be digital? I believe that the very first wave that we will see with the larger, relatively flat displays will result in a tremendous shift away from knobs and switches and buttons even at the lower end even at the lower end okay with more emphasis on touch and we'll talk a little bit about voice so voice capability that's what i want to yes. get over there yes. because you know let's be honest from a safety point of view 
uh, there is a debate. We are missing knobs, the tactile factor. You know, you can just adjust without taking your eyes off the road. Is voice activation the solution for that? We have vo voice is indeed the solution, and voice technology has made tremendous progress. And what's Visteon doing in that? Area? Right. So Visteon has our own voice technology. So what has happened? What's different in voice? Up till recently, the traditional approach to voice recognition was more of a, a voice analysis and DSP processing that fundamentally was built on the principle of recognizing phonemes, right? You broke down your speech into phonemes and you tried to pattern match on those phonemes. What was the challenge with that? The different accents, different ways of, of, of uh, you know, pronunciation. Some people have a, a, a way of rendering that is very different from others. That um, process of breaking it down into phonemes and, and then doing a pattern recognition was inherently failure prone. So if you got to about 85% accuracy, that was considered very good. But 85% means that you miss one out of 10 words. Correct. Not That's good not good enough. enough. Right. Now, what changed that? The big shift was the move to AI, right. artificial intelligence, using massive amounts of data. Right. We are now reaching 95 plus percent accuracy, which is about as much as the human right. level of accuracy. And about 96, 97 is what you need to get to essentially consider it as perfect. So we are about there already today. So this technology is making the interaction with the car because in the car, you actually say the same few sentences, maybe it's said differently. It's not a open conversation. You're not having a, you know, evening conversation with the car. You are commanding it to do certain things. So there is a limit to the range of things you can say, which is actually helpful in improving the efficiency. So and voice, yeah. Yeah, voice is becoming a very credible solution. So my, my take on it is the following. In order to enable the shift to voice, you cannot do that with the ECE architectures of today. The processing demands on that requires a shift to a different architecture. Ethernet. Probably. Ethernet based and more processing capabilities like smart core. And maybe on the distraction side, some level of ADAS could take care of uh, safety Absolutely. issues. I think, I, think, I think that's the biggest uh, need for ADAS is, you know, there is driver distraction and that's where ADAS can be a lifesaver. Exactly. So let's talk about that a little bit, right? I drive a vehicle although in the US, with ADAS turned on all the time. And right. I find myself... It's about level two? It's level two. Right. It's a Tesla. I drive a Tesla. And what I find really useful about it is sometimes when I'm on the call, right, although it's a speakerphone, as I'm driving, my mind may be distracted a little bit and I may miss certain uh, blind spots and other things around the car. ADAS is a great way to visualize what's around me in the car. It warns me if I'm uh, you know, making any lane change or any maneuver that might be risky. So it's a it's a very useful thing to have. And that's what is driving the adoption of ADAS. ADAS is coming to India in a big way now. Right. Right. We've seen that. Absolutely. Yeah. And so with ADAS and now more driver monitoring. Right. That's also looking for signs of fatigue, distraction, fatigue, right? Will improve that safety uh, factor here in India. I think what we need to do as an automotive industry is own the responsibility of making the driver experience both convenient and safe. There are far too many accidents on the roads that Correct. take a lot of life and limb. We need to reduce that. We have the technology to do it now. Moving to the other end, two-wheelers. A lot of scope there. Uh, we are biggest two-wheeler market. Uh, we've seen even EVs are taking off. Uh, so, you know, I mean, is there a lot of potential? Is that an exciting part of the market, uh, you know, the two-wheeler side? Absolutely. Because clearly, that's where the next wave of digital displays is going to come. What many people don't know is that we, as Visteon, already today, supply about a million clusters for two-wheelers a year, right? But a million in a market, that's about 50 million each year. Right. Now, what's even more exciting to, for me in particular is many of the trends that we have talked about already, right? Increased uh, processing capabilities, connectivity, uh, ADAS, are also coming into two wheelers. So what you're seeing from cars, there's a bit of a lag, but it's definitely coming into exactly. two wheelers. Exactly, well. absolutely. And so we already have three OEMs that we are working with. The largest OEM in the world when it comes to two wheelers is Honda. Honda. And so Honda is our lead customer for technology, where they are now taking bigger screens, bigger displays in the two wheeler, 
with a lot of connectivity with the phone, with the cloud. And we are now looking at how do we bring ADAS functionality into it. For two wheelers. So, well. For two wheelers. So think of smart core for two wheelers. Right. The technology is actually very similar. So to your point, what we see in passenger vehicles is now starting to come into the two wheelers. Right. I want to shift, uh, you know, tack to, of course, a topic we can't, uh, we can't avoid. And I mean, uh, it is the future, which is EVs. Now, you know, EVs are digitally native, so it kind of uh, lends itself to uh, digital cockpits and things like that. So, you know, on the EV space, uh, I understand, obviously, it's exciting because it lends to your technology. Uh, so, want to know what's happening there and even specifically to new technologies which you all are getting into like battery management systems and more EV related uh, tech. Uh, is that going to be a big uh, focus driver in the future? Right. So, we are very excited about this transformation. Uh, as you mentioned, it is a transformation that's actually accretive, beneficial to Vistion because all EVs mostly are digital natives and born EVs are even more so. There is an expectation in uh, the consumers that an EV should come with a lot of tech. It's effectively in their minds, the first mobile device on wheels. So we have to address that aspiration and expectation as well. The other thing I would say is, I have been actually positively surprised by how quick this transformation is happening in other parts of the world. And it's instructive to look at that because I believe something like that will happen in India. So if you look at the first quarter in China, over 25% of new vehicles sold were EVs, 25%. And this after the government relaxed the, the incentives, incentives that they were offering previously. So the incentives are no longer there. And yet a fourth of new cars sold in China were EVs. Now, when you look at Europe, okay, you may say, fine, China, China is a different beast. Let's look at Europe. Europe was over 20%. Okay, in the first quarter. So one in five cars sold in was an EV. EV, right? Now, when you look at US, we are just starting to see about 5% of the vehicles sold are EVs. And that's because it's largely Tesla. But what's changing is that many of the larger OEMs, look at Ford. Look at Ford, Ford. huge yes. investment. Huge investment and some big successes right. quickly. Okay. Mark, Mark E, e. Yeah. was an amazing success. Right. They couldn't build enough. Yeah. The new Ford F-150 Lightning right. truck yeah. And we are very proud to have our product in it. Yeah. Tremendous success. What they've done is that $40,000, a big truck, that's an EV, right? So what we expect to see is that EVs will ramp up very quickly. We have a very large piece of business with General Motors. General Motors has made a big commitment to EVs. In fact, they want to have over a million EVs a year by 2025. And 100% of those vehicles come with Vistion battery management solution. Right. So I would like to talk to you about what makes battery management unique, why is it so important, right? And what do we think will happen in the Indian market? Now, EVs were built even earlier, right? It's not like we're building EVs for the first time now. Fistion started offering BMS mainly to GM. You may remember GM had the Volt and the Bolt, right. Right, the early, early first generation. sort of uh, yeah. generation uh, EVs. Yeah. And we were suppliers of BMS to them. So we have sold almost a million BMS already. So we had some experience in, in that particular product. What we are seeing in more at, uh, those parts of the world is that people are now all building, uh, I would say, born EVs. It's right. a complete new platform. It's Correct. designed for absolutely. EVs. Yeah. It's not an ICE that has been adapted for EVs. Right. So absolutely right. flat floor, perfect packaging, all that. Exactly. Thing. And the body design and the structure is all designed to carry right. that sort of weight. So what happens in an EV like that is that you have over 100 cells that each individually has to be managed carefully for state of health. Right. Batteries perform the best when you maintain them at a steady temperature. Right. They also perform very well if you know exactly the state of charge right. and then charge or discharge accordingly. And NMCs are tricky in this regard. Very, very tricky. More than LFP. Ex absolutely. Because, you know, th there is the chemistry difference there. Right. LFPs are a little more forgiving in right. that sense. Right. Although they deliver less, less of power. Density, exactly. Yeah. So we at Vistion worked very hard on this for about, I would say, five, six years. And our focus was to make the best battery management system possible. Why? That's the brains of the powertrain. Okay. When you press the accelerator, it's the BMS that That's determines right. how much charge does the motor need, which cell does it tap it from, 
and coordinate all of that choreography to deliver the right power to the motor. The same time when you brake, it determines how to do the reverse and do the charging. The last question I really want to ask you about and again, we cannot not have a conversation without the chip crisis and the shortage which really impacts uh, products like yours. So really, I just want to get an understanding is how is Visteon managing this number one? Uh, I've heard that, you know, there are sort of different, some OEMs are even using different uh, products, smaller screens to kind of which have uh, fewer chips uh, so that there's no supply constraint over there. And going forward, how do you see this panning out, uh, you know, the, the whole chip crisis? No, that's a terrific question. Okay. And Visteon is one of the largest users of semiconductors in the entire automotive industry because everything we build is built with a lot of semiconductors. So your perspective would really be very Absolutely. And I am extremely close to the industry, have, have many, many meetings with them and I've made it my business to understand how that industry works, what are the dynamics there and why did we end up in this problem and how will we get out of it? So I'll, I'll just take a couple of minutes Please. to tell you how did this happen. Now, if you go back a little bit to say 2017 and 18 timeframe, where in 2017, as a global industry, we built 95 million cars in the globe, which was the highest we had ever built. Okay. So at that point in time, the industry was expecting a slowdown because as you know, this industry is cyclical. cyclical. And so everybody was expecting a down cycle. And a down cycle typically, if you go back 40 years and analyze, lasted two to three years maximum, and then we would come back up. So the automotive industry knew this, the supply base knew this. So going into 2019, everybody was pressing the brakes. And in adjusting spending, capacity. Adjusting the capacity. So we were expecting a slowdown and the slowdown did indeed start. Okay, from 2017 of 95 million, we came down in 2018. In 2019, we were at 88 million units globally. So everybody was kind of on their uh, job saying, okay, we are managing the business. But then when 2020 occurred and, and we pandemic. went into this pandemic situation, one thing the industry did, which perhaps in hindsight it shouldn't have, but in the heat of the moment, panic. it's hard to, to tell you know anything. They pulled their orders. Panic okay, and panicked. Their orders. Okay, now the automotive industry may do that, but the semiconductor industry does not work with very short lead times. Their lead times, the so-called the front end of the process, so when you build a chip, the first thing you make is the wafer. Right. And the wafer process, it's a fabrication process that takes up to six months and you cannot interrupt it. Once you start and say, I'm going to build this type of chips for the wafer to come out, you have to wait for about six months. And then there's a back end to it, which is you take that wafer and you cut it, you package it, package you it. test it, right? And then you ship it that process is about two months. So that's the eight month cycle that everybody has to respect. But when we pulled the orders in, when everybody felt that the world was coming to an end, the second quarter of 2020, those suppliers had to repurpose their wafers to other industries. And then what happened was in Q3 itself for 2020 industry came roaring back and Q4 was even uh, stronger. Right. So what happened was we consumed all of the inventory that was available, but the industry, the semiconductor industry had diverted their supply to the consumers, other industries. Yeah, yeah. And consumer Very was common. also booming because everyone was working from home. Correct. We all wanted more televisions, tablets, phones, equipment that would allow us to work from home. So demand from everybody was at a peak. So we quickly run out, ran out of uh, inventory. Now that was felt very quickly in 2021, second quarter, this realization dawned upon the industry. So we started to work with our suppliers to put more investment, to build more fabs and more capacity across the industry. Now it's important to understand that there is plenty of semiconductor capacity for a certain class of semiconductors. So semiconductors, the smaller ones, the smaller ones, small uh, in terms of nanometer technology. The term in the industry used is called process node. Okay, a process node of 40 nanometers and less. There's plenty of capacity because TSMC really? and other semiconductor fab suppliers, right? So these guys just do fabs and pro provide the wafers. They have invested heavily in the last five years. Okay, and they've gone successively from 40 to 28 nanometers to 40 nanometers, 10 nanometers, seven and so on. Today, 
for many of our processing, we are using 10 nanometers or 7 nanometers. But there are some chips we use in automotive in particular that are 40 nanometers and greater. And that's yeah. where the supply crunch That's is. where the supply crunch is. So it's a very uneven supply. So if we have a lot of supply of some semiconductors, only a very small handful. But even one chip can hold up a car. That is the situation. All you need is one chip to be short that you cannot build a complete product. Now, how will we get out of the situation? So investments were made towards the second half of last year in adding more capacity. But it would always be below in the small, in the smaller chips. Uh, no, so even in the larger one, because they realized that the industry could not quickly shift. Right. right. So Texas Instruments, for example, put a lot of investment in it, microchip, on semi, and everybody put some investment to increase capacity. There's plenty of capacity on the uh, advanced nodes, on the lagging nodes. That capacity will come online because it takes about a, in normal times, it used to take about three years when you first buy the equipment to when the chips start to flow. With all the pressure on them, they are starting to get it earlier. So middle of last year, they put the investments, middle of next year, so two years, they will start to ship chips from the new capacity. So you feel up to the middle of next year? Up to middle of next year, we have to survive with all of this stuff that we are doing, which is purchasing on spot buys, paying ridiculous amounts of money for the chips, redesigning parts. In some cases, cars being offered with some of the components not even configured, right? right. lower spec. So we'll do whatever we need to do to survive. But I expect us to be back into the excess capacity situation with semiconductors by middle of next year. Right. And at that point, nobody will be talking about semiconductors anymore. anymore. This right. will be behind us, thankfully. And I think all of us will heave a, a big sigh of relief. What would you think in this interim until July uh, 23 or the middle of 23 is the way forward? What are the smart things OEMs need to do to kind of survive? through this chip crisis. Uh, we've seen something even with your displays, to be honest, some manufacturers have gone from 10 inch to 8 inch just to take advantage of that, you know, displays with fewer chips. Is that one of the kind of smart yeah. ways to do it? There are three things that we advise our customers. Number one is to have that flexibility, what you're referring to. Be nimble to use different products that are available, right? Because not everything is in short supply. What's interesting is displays were a critical issue for us last year, okay? Uh, and, and going into the end of the year. The biggest problem, if you were to ask me the same question, like October, November last year, I would have said displays. Today, displays are not a problem. We have built enough capacity and we are getting the product. Having said that, we advise our customers, the car makers, to do two additional things beyond being nimble. One is to support redesign, quick redesigns and introduction of alternate designs quickly to uh, mitigate uh, this issue. By effectively, if we are saying, okay, we are using a Texas semiconductor chip, how about if we add a other semiconductor supplier like uh, analog uh, devices or uh, uh, ST, they are chips, slightly different, but we can offer this and the other one to make up for the shortages in the quantity. And the third thing is to be very aggressive to look at open market. That's it's always, costly. it is costly, right? But it at least allows them to continue to retain their market share until things improve, right? This is a, going to be a game of market share for everybody. Losing market share and then recovering is a very hard thing to do, as you know. So maintaining that would be one of our objectives. And, you know, just lastly, so clearly what you're saying is from uh, the worst is behind us as far as displays go. And just for your customers, I mean, uh, you know, anyone having Vistion products, uh, what you're saying is the chip issue is not so big for you as maybe it would be for other suppliers. No, the chip issue is big. I wouldn't say it's not as big, but we have a lot of uh, relationships we can leverage because right. of the uh, you know position that we have in the industry. And we have uh, really good capabilities to redesign because it also comes from the fact that this is the core of our business, right? There are very few companies that have the kind of capabilities that Vestion has simply because this is all we do. Many of the other suppliers have other businesses as well. So we have a certain capability that is not very commonly found in the industry. So my message has been uh, that we'll work through this crisis together with them. We'll come up with different strategies. I was on the call with um, an OEM last night and uh, we went through uh, a, a set of five or six different actions we had taken 
to mitigate the situation. Actions were kicks uh, started middle of last year. And as a result, from September, end of September onwards, we'll be able to supply them 100% of the demand. Can you believe it? From end of September onwards. But because they planned at that time. Exactly. Because we did about five different things. Right. Five different things. If we were not to do those things, we would not be able to supply even 25% of the demand. And those five things are just the kind of smart kind of... Uh, exactly. Redesigns, right. alternate parts, right? right? Uh, bringing in different suppliers rather than be dependent on one. So all those five that we were tracking very closely, we are now able but to... But to be honest, yeah, yeah. does that compromise the overall end user consumer experience a little bit? No, I'll tell you where it doesn't compromise the uh, experience at all. What it does do is it's a cost. Got it. Right. I mean, we have taken a lot of cost to do these things that in the normal environment would, would not, not have been there. Correct. It's a cost on us. It's a cost on the car manufacturer because right. they have to support us introducing right. all of these things. Our inventories have gone up as a result right. because we have to buy all these. So the dollar impact has been high. Right. Okay. But in terms of the end user, absolutely no difference. And we right. would not do anything that compromises on quality. Right. Okay. So we go through the same quality checks, same quality processes, testing, etc. Because you do not want to have any issue with your reputation. Reputation right. in this industry is everything. Right. I think that's a great note to end on. Reputation is everything. Quality is everything. And it's been really a fascinating conversation, Sachin. And uh, really, I've learned a lot. It's been very educational as well. And uh, wish you all the best and, uh, and huge success going forward. And looking forward to seeing uh, Vistion grow more and more in India, which is your home country as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. And I look forward to more conversations with you. I enjoyed this discussion a Thank lot. You. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks.